This is probably one of the biggest problems for me, at least, and that is that your meeting goes too long. If your meetings go too long, people will just find ways of, to avoid attending them because it's such an awful experience and it just feels like such a waste of time. So either you'll avoid attending them or you'll come with other work to do, or you'll come and you just realize that, hey, I'm just going to be daydreaming for a lot of this and I'm just going to be starting to dream about being on the lake in the summer and my mind will be elsewhere. My body's there, but my mind is far away. Parkinson's law states that work expands to fill the time available for its completion. You may have heard of this before, it's commonly quoted, but nowhere is this more true than for meetings. The longer you have to run a meeting, the longer that meeting is gonna go. Someone can always think of something else to talk about, think of another rabbit trail to run down. Here's a great solution, just appoint a timekeeper. So decide before the meeting, here's what the meeting is for, here's what we're gonna get done, and we're going to be in that room for 45 minutes. So Emily, you're gonna be our timekeeper, so please keep us on track as to where time is. When that 45 minutes is up, we're just gonna be done and we're gonna stand up and walk away. It's really effective and it works really well. The timekeeper should be someone who isn't running the meeting, a third party who just keeps that shot clock running and, and tells us how much time we have left. Our next problem is that meetings don't start on time. And it's usually for good intentions and it's because we wanna wait for the stragglers. You know what, he just had to use a washroom. He'll be done as, he'll be here as soon as he's done. Or, you know, she's just on the phone. And as soon as that call is wrapped up, she'll be here. She might just be a couple minutes late. Let's just wait for them because it's just gonna take a couple of minutes and the time ticks away and now it's six and now it's seven minutes. And people who are there on time are looking at their watch thinking, why did I make the effort to be on time? And by the way, next time, if I'm a few minutes late, my time won't be wasted and I won't have to sit here and wait. So I'll just be a little bit late next time too. And very soon it gets chronic and meetings always start late. Here's a solution to meetings that don't start on time. Try starting at an odd time. So rather than starting at nine, say, hey, let's start at 9.02 or let's start the meeting at 3.21. And by being so precise and designating the minute you're gonna start, sometimes a little psychological trick, sometimes people will make a, a bigger effort to be on time. But whatever trick you use or however you wanna approach that, just be committed to, st to starting precisely on time because people do what works. If lateness stops working, they'll stop being late. Like if, if they come and they interrupt the meeting and it's in full swing and they have to bustle by people and come and sit down and they realize they're late, next time they won't be late. So just don't get into the habit of waiting for stragglers. Start right on time, honor and reward the people who made the effort to be there on time. Here's a big problem. Participants don't necessarily know why the meeting even matters. Like they know they're supposed to be there. They know that it's on the calendar. Everyone has to be there at 9.02, whatever that time is. But they think, why, should we, why are we even doing this? Why does the meeting matter? Here's a solution that you may not have tried before. Start with a why. Before the meeting begins, explain why this meeting is really important. Why, we, why we're meeting here, it's not just routine. We're doing it because it really matters for a certain reason. So begin with why the meeting matters. Talk about what you're going to achieve or decide. Talk about when you're gonna end so they all know that, hey, when this time comes, we can get up and leave. But then talk about what happens if you get the meeting right or what happens if you get it wrong. So let's take an example of a meeting that is typically not thought of as super exhilarating and that is, let's say, a budget meeting. So you could start by saying, look, here's what we're gonna do today, friends. We're finalizing our year's budget. It's gonna be a long meeting. We're gonna be here for two hours. So we're ending in two hours. But if we get this right, we're gonna set our company up for financial success for an entire year. It's really important that we focus these uh, next two hours because if we get it wrong, we could cause serious harm to our company. We could potentially bankrupt our company or we could lose the respect of all the people who look to us to give them leadership. So let's really focus in for these next two hours. Let's give it our all. We'll take short breaks and we're gonna get it done. By the time we walk out of this room, it's gonna be finalized. Very different approach to a meeting and it tells us all that this meeting matters and I need to concentrate because it's important. Next problem, participants don't actually need to be there. We include people so they can feel included. Motives are always good. We think, hey, you know, they need to be in the loop or we want to include everyone. We don't want someone to feel left out. Sometimes we're not even sure why we include people. We're not even sure why they're in the room, but they're just there because that's how we've always done it. The solution is to structure the meeting so people can leave when their part is finished. 
So if you need a finance person there for the first part of the meeting, invite them for the first part, put them on first. And as soon as their part is done, encourage them to go get on with their day. They don't have to hang around till the end. Just encourage people to leave if the meeting doesn't concern them. It doesn't touch on their department or whatever. Just encourage them to get back to work and leave the meeting. And don't invite anyone who doesn't absolutely need to be there. So don't invite people just so that they can feel included, like everyone in the department should be here because, you know, that's just the way we do it. Uh, if, if they're not really relevant to the meeting, if they're not a decision maker, if they don't need to be there, don't invite them just so that they feel included. Problem. One person dominates the meeting. We've all sat in meetings like this where one person does all the talking or maybe two people or three people and everybody else sits there listening and bored and tuned out and daydreaming. The solution is to make sure everyone has a chance to speak and also to control those dominators. So I, these are questions that I like. Jane, what are you not saying? Liam, you've been quiet, but I know you have an opinion on this. What is it? Encourage them to talk and reward them when they do talk. If someone uh, pipes up with a contrary opinion, reward them, thank them for speaking up. Here's some strategies you might try for dealing with those meeting uh, dominators. The first thing I would suggest is to notice how the room is set up and make sure that you seat your dominators beside you. So if you walk into a room and they're there, just make sure that you're sitting beside them. And I would also say, just if you have any problem people, make sure they're within your arm's reach. And all you have to do is once they've said enough and once they're dominating the meeting, just touch their shoulder and they're gonna pick up that nonverbal cue that maybe it's time for them to stop. Try directing conversation away from them. Uh, deflect, say something like, thanks Emily. Let's say Emily's your dominator. Thanks Emily, I really appreciate that opinion. Now, I'd like to hear from Amanda, as she's been quiet up to now. So call someone else out, or you can just even be more direct and just say, now, I wanna hear from people who haven't talked a lot. So we've heard from some of, some of these folks. I would like to some of, hear from some of the people who have been quiet throughout this meeting. Now, what about when you're the meeting dominator? Because let's be honest, usually the meeting dominator is the person who's running the meeting. So here's a simple formula. Just ask yourself, how many people are in the room? How many people are attending the meeting? And then just speak in proportion to the number of participants that are there. So here's an example. If there are five participants, just know you get to speak 20% of the time. So four people need to speak before you can talk again. Just speak in proportion to the amount of uh, participants that are there. If there are 10 participants, speak 10% of the time. Uh, there was a client once who just couldn't figure this out. He was such a talker. Uh, in disc terms, he was a very high I. He was very verbal and he naturally was a meeting dominator. So here's what he did. He just put five coins in his pocket and every time he talked, he spent a coin. So he just lay it on the table in front of him and he'd think, okay, I've got only four more comments. Uh, here we go again, I'm spending another one. Now I've got three more comments. Do what you need to do so that you are not a meeting dominator. If you're the meeting leader, you really should be asking a lot more than you're saying. Next problem, false harmony. You know that this is a problem when everyone nods, but they're only pretending that they agree. The solution to false harmony is to explode the landmines yourself. People don't say what they're really thinking and people nod and give their assent when they really don't mean it for a few reasons. First, sometimes maybe they think that revenge will be taken on them. So they think I'm not going to say anything, or maybe they think the meeting leader really just doesn't even care about what I have to say, or maybe they're just timid and they don't want to cause conflict or don't want to disagree. So you need to go into that meeting, recognizing that there are different points of view and you want it to be okay for them to bring them up. So explode those landmines. If you suspect that there are alternate points of view in the room, then bring them up before even they can. So you might say something like, I wonder if some people in the room here are thinking actually painting the walls of reception lime green is a bad idea. Maybe some of you think our clients will hate it. I wonder if there's anyone in the room who might think that. So think of the most controversial question uh, that you can think of and then bring it up, explode that landmine and open up that conversation. Next, thank people for disagreeing with you. Make it okay. So when they bring up another point of view that's different from yours, say, you know, thank you so much for bringing up an alternate point of view. Because the truth is, you're going to come to the best decisions as a team when there's really robust, unfiltered debate. So you want to encourage that debate and you want to get it out there. Just make sure that you're encouraging different viewpoints. You're rewarding people who bring them up.
And our final problem, team communication is chronically poor. And here's how this looks. You don't normally have meetings, but suddenly the boss comes in and says, we've got a problem. Everyone get in the boardroom and we're gonna solve it, which is okay in a crisis, but if it happens regularly, it's not ideal. Meetings are ad hoc and they're called only when you think they're needed. And usually it's an emergency. And the solution is to establish a meeting rhythm. My hope for your organization is that you will have a series of intentional meetings that are planned, that are timed, and that are really effective. And that is the topic of our next module. Let's review what you learned in this module. First, you learned the main killers of effective meetings, and you learned the best practices to make your meetings engaging and great.